Good evening and welcome to the UP Community Health Town Hall Program. Uh, tonight's episode is based on epilepsy awareness. Uh, my name is Lee Spur, and uh, this evening's program is being hosted by the Center for Rural Health at Northern Michigan University. Um, the program has also uh, been organized in partnership with Dr. Kelly Cam, uh, epidemiologist and assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Integrative Physiology at Michigan Technological University. Kelly's unable to join us this evening, um, but she provided me a lot of statistics to share with everyone. And so I really look forward to talking more about epilepsy with everybody tonight. Um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce tonight's panelists. We have uh, Liz Preston. Liz is a student at Northern Michigan University. She is also a board member of the Grow and Lead Community Youth Development Board here in Marquette. Thanks for coming, Liz. Uh, we also have Kathy Ag. Um, Kathy is actually Liz Preston's mother. <laughs> and um, we thought it would be great to get not only uh, individual perception of somebody with epilepsy, but also parent perspective. So we look forward to hearing uh, from Kathy as well. Uh, we also have Renee Roderer. Hello, Renee. Um, Renee is, let's see, Renee is the Community Care Director for the Ep Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. Thanks for joining us, Renee. And lastly, we have Tameta Kozart. Um, Tameta is joining us. Um, she is the Multicultural Outreach and Health Equity Officer for the Epilepsy Foundation, which is a national organization. So thank you for joining us, Tameta. Nice to have you here. So um, let's get started with a few statistics. Kelly left me a lot of information to share. I'm going to kind of drill through this real quickly, and then we'll get in and start with Liz talking with us a little bit. So in defining epilepsy, um, it is a disorder of the brain, and it's typically diagnosed when a person has two or more seizures. Um, and not all seizures that people experience are due to epilepsy. So we shouldn't jump to assumptions um, just because someone has a seizure. Um, the seizure is in essence a short change in normal brain activity. Um, it might cause a person to fall and lose awareness of what's going on around them. Um, sometimes it can also look like someone is staring at something that's not there for a short period of time. So there isn't just one way to tell if somebody is necessarily having a seizure. Um, there's also different kinds of seizures that people can experience. Um, there's different uh, reasons or different episodes that can cause um, epilepsy. Uh, but for most people, and this, was, uh, this is hard to believe, two-thirds, um, the cause is not known. So um, that, that's kind of interesting because you like to tie science right away to something. And there's still a lot to be really discovered with epilepsy. Uh, some of the common, uh, I guess, the causes right now, uh, stroke, brain tumor, loss, loss of oxygen to the brain, certain genetic disorders, and certain neurological diseases. Um, as far as the distribution of epilepsy, uh, one of the most common conditions affecting the brain it's the second most common neurological disease after a stroke. So I wasn't aware of that until I got these statistics from Kelly. So that was kind of surprising to me. Um, let's see, 5.1 million people in the US share, have a history of epilepsy. Uh, 3.4 million people in the US uh, currently have active epilepsy. And this is uh, equivalent to just over 1% of the US population. So that, that breaks down to 3 million adults and about 470,000 kids. Uh, in Michigan, there is approximately 108,900 uh, 108, individuals with active epilepsy of all ages. Uh, approximately 13,600 of those cases are in children um, between birth and 17. Uh, Michigan ranks number nine as far as states when it comes to epilepsy. And the highest right now is Mississippi. Uh, estimated uh, direct costs associated with epilepsy in the US is $28 billion a year based on a 2020 report. Uh, some of the risks, let's see, risk factors and impacts. 
Um, there is a higher risk in low income countries compared to high income countries. I remember Kelly and I actually had a conversation about that. Uh, there has not been necessarily a direct correlation to this, but some of it is uh, believed um, that the higher impact um, is the result of low income, less insurance, less access to health care, things like that that can impact uh, health care. Um, let's see. About a third of adults with epilepsy are unable to work. A bit more half, let's see, a bit more than half of adults taking medication still have seizures. And about two thirds of adults with epilepsy have at least four other chronic conditions. So some of those could be um, psychiatric conditions such as depression, anxiety, psychosis type one diabetes, arthritis, COPD, and digestive tract ulcers. Uh, there's also injuries uh, due to seizures when you have fractures, bruises, burns. Um, those can happen when you have seizures as well as you have no control at that moment you know, over your body. Implications are um, stigma and discrimination against people who do have epilepsy. And um, let's see, what else can I read to you? Uh, prevent the condition uh, that can be related to epilepsy is reducing the risk of stroke, preventing brain injuries, prenatal care to prevent birth injuries that can lead to epilepsy, and preventing infectious diseases that can cause or that can lead to epilepsy. So vaccinations, healthy habits, things like that. Um, and it's important to receive appropriate care to be able to manage epilepsy as well. So that being said, uh, Liz Preston, who is a student at Northern Michigan University, um, Liz actually works a little bit with our department and engages with us here at the Center for Rural Health. And she came to me quite a few months ago, well, not that long ago, but a few months ago, and uh, really asked if there was anything that, that we could do at the center to help increase awareness about epilepsy. And then she proceeded to talk about her story a little bit as somebody with epilepsy. And I have only been at Northern for three years, but I have never seen a student so actively engaged and passionate about any kind of health condition like this. And so I just want to commend you, Liz, because I mean, it's, it's wonderful how much of an advocate you are. Uh, it's very brave. And I really think that by getting this, this program out and by normalizing some of the conversation that we can help to reduce the negative stigma around this and really get people talking and increase support. So I wanna thank you for bringing that you know, to everybody's attention. So thanks for joining us tonight. And if you wanna talk a little bit about your personal experience, that would be great. Thank you so much for those kind words and thank you so much for having me. And I'm so happy to be here and to share a little bit more about my story and epilepsy in general. So I was diagnosed with epilepsy when I was 14 years old and there are actually over 30 different types of seizures and over 60 different types of epilepsy. So it can look very different for a lot of different people. For me, that looks like I had juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And what that meant is I had myoclonic seizures and tonic clonic seizures. And tonic means stiff and clonic means twitching. So another word for this, you may have heard the phrase grand mal. And this is that classic seizure, what you think of on the ground unconscious. But I also have what you call myoclonic seizures. And myo means muscle and clonic means that twitching, jerking. And they're just like little muscle spasms like that. And I'm conscious the whole time. And then oftentimes when they're greater and faster and closer together, then I know a tonic clonic is coming. So I was 14 years old and I started having those myoclonic muscle spasms. And um, I wasn't really sure what they were. I talked to my mom about them, thought maybe they're just tired muscles. And then they continued to get worse to the point where it's falling down. And I had my first seizure. And it was awful. Couldn't remember anything that happened last day. I was exhausted. I was throwing up and went to the hospital. They said, all right, come back for EGs, MRIs, all that. I sat down in the hospital room with my mom. Neurologist said, 
you have epilepsy, very bluntly. My mom broke down in tears and I just stared blankly because I didn't know what epilepsy was. I was 14. I kind of know what a seizure was. had no idea what epilepsy was. So I was just wondering, like, is this going to affect me? Like, is there much to it? And I had no idea how much it was going to affect me because there's so much more, so, so much more to epilepsy than just seizures. It's exhaustion, memory loss, stigma, so much to it. And I really do feel like it just kind of took over my life in high school. But an amazing thing that came uh, to my life was the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, which is a chapter branch to the Epilepsy Foundation of America. And I discovered that two years after my diagnosis. So I was 16 years old. And that was incredible. Like even I just started going to events. um, And that was amazing just to connect with people, tell each other's stories but then also share resources. Oh, well, maybe try this medication, try this doctor, try this clinic. That was huge. Um, I was then able to become an advocate myself and become a counselor at camps for people and for children with epilepsy. And I've had people tell me like, thank you for changing my mind on epilepsy and my views on it. And that's huge. And I just continue to be involved and that's what I like to continue to do. And that's why I'm here today. Liz, did you, when you were going through this, did you know anyone else who had epilepsy or was this your first kind of introduction to epilepsy? I actually did know one person. So I was a competitive baton twirler in middle school. And it was just a few months before I was diagnosed with epilepsy that I saw her have a seizure. And of course, I was scared by it. I had no idea what it was or what was really going on. And then a few months later, well, I found out myself um, a little bit more about what it was and going on. So I was really blessed to have her in my life to talk a little bit more about it. Um, But then I'm the one who actually found the Epilepsy Foundation. And because she had it for like seven years before knowing about the Epilepsy Foundation, which or anything like that or knowing someone So it was really great that I was able to introduce her to some more resources and to these groups and things like that. And Liz, can you talk a little bit about any stigma that you may have experienced uh, between your initial diagnosis as well as now? Yeah, of course. So there's definitely a stigma of, um, I feel like this has definitely gotten better, but some people can think that people with epilepsy may not be as smart. like. Um, it's like with mental health, a lot of times I think over the years, we've gotten a lot better at mental health. I think before people thought, oh, well, you know, people with mental health, they got kind of problems, you know, and we're getting a lot better because we're talking about it, bringing awareness or being statistics. And I think that's really good to continue to do with epilepsy. So there's not these misconstrued whatever, um, because a lot of people think, Oh, flashing lights. And actually only 3% of people react to flashing lights who have epilepsy. And there's a lot of bullying that can happen, particularly among children. Um, after my first seizure in high school, I was bullied behind my back. A few, few mean things were said. And I was a counselor for children with epilepsy. And I even had a camper say to me, like, I don't tell a lot of people I have epilepsy because I'm scared of being made fun of. And there's definitely definitely a stigma out there. And I've known quite a few people, unfortunately, who have lost jobs because of it. Um, They've had seizures at work and then lost their jobs. And it's very, very hard to prove because big corporations can easily back up, draw out cases and say, oh, well, it was because of something else. Um, So there's definitely a stigma against it for sure. Yeah, I know you and I talked a little bit about this and Mm -hmm. I had, I divulged that at one point I was a um, director of financial aid and I was giving a financial aid presentation to parents and students about how to fill out the FAFSA form. And somebody cracked a joke in class and we were all laughing. And the person in the front row had grabbed their desk and they were shaking their desk. And I thought it was part of the whole laughing thing that was going on. And then it turned out to be a seizure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it was, you know, once it clicked in my head, oh, this is what this is, I realized, now what? You know, like, what do you do? And um, 
I guess I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, because I think that it would be great to be able to educate people a little bit so that they're not scared, that they can help, you know, the best that they can. Well, and did anyone know in that class what to do or what happened then? What happened next? Um, Immediately, somebody had called 911. They just didn't know any better. These are all people that didn't know each other. So it was just a variety of different families Mm -hmm. that were showing up to fill out a financial aid form. And, And I think you and I talked about this a little bit about how at times it can be unnecessary to call 911. Um, mm-hmm. if you know what to do and if you are common and, and familiar with this. But I, I do think at the time, nobody knew anything. And they didn't know if this person had been previously diagnosed. And so nobody wanted to take a chance, you know, call yeah. the professionals. Yeah, of course. I mean, people remember those. I mean, my mom even shares about in college, she was taking an exam. A student had a seizure and they left and dismissed the exam. You know, they didn't really know what to do. And for sure, if we can avoid calling the ambulance, that's great because it's $700 just to call an ambulance and that's not fun to pay. So it's always good if we can avoid that. Um, You only need to call an ambulance if it's longer than five minutes, they're pregnant, or it's their first seizure. So you can learn a lot more about it than just a brief thing of what I'm giving you, but you can often look, they'll have some medical bracelet, medical necklace, Um, often on their phone, they may have something. Um, but if you want to learn a little bit more, there's a lot of resources on the Epilepsy Foundation of America. There's a 30 minute learning course about what to do in the event of a seizure. And that's pretty brief, um, just kind of what to do. But then I really would recommend doing the 90 minute course because it goes a little more in depth and it talks about different types of seizures because some seizures doesn't even look like one, like you just stare off blankly and that's a seizure. And it talks even about statistics because I had epilepsy for seven years before I even took this course. I just took it a few months ago, actually. And I learned things like suicide is 22% higher in people with epilepsy. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I didn't know that. Like, I'm really glad I took this course. So that's just why something I encourage everyone to take. Um, and for, you know, like you said, you could be in a class, you could be, I had one at a ski area, you know, like you could be anywhere. Um, at an airport, you know, and so these are courses that are free, online, on demand, and at any time, so I don't really want any excuses, because it's, yeah, it's any time, it's free, and it's just 30 minutes of your time, or 90 minutes of your time, and I think that's doable for, for someone's life, you know. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up uh, talking about medical bracelets or medical necklaces. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think of that when it comes to allergic reactions. But Mm -hmm. I think that's important to know that it's just as, uh, you know, it relates to this just as well. So thank you for that. Um, Do you have any advice for youth who either may have, you know, may be diagnosed or are diagnosed? Um, Having lived with this as a young person yourself? Yeah, I would definitely just say don't go through it alone. Um, I, of course, want to say, like, get involved, speak up about it. But I know a lot of people can be uncomfortable with that. And I totally can understand that. So I think just find your tribe, find your group. So in the Epilepsy Foundation, you can attend an event. Um, There's many resources to look into. There's virtual groups to attend. There's... Renee, you're welcome to chime in with any other things I'm missing. There's just an infinite number of a million things you can look into. So I would highly recommend checking out the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan or for your state or um, for Epilepsy Foundation of America um, because it's just helped so many people and just to not go through it alone is huge. Great. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Um, For listeners who might just be joining us, uh, my name is Elise Burr, and this is the UP Community Health Town Hall Show. Uh, This this month's program, tonight's program, is based on epilepsy awareness. Um, So we'd like to thank everybody who's here joining us tonight. Uh, Liz Preston, student at Northern Michigan University. Kathy Agee, uh, parent of Liz Preston. Um, we also have Renee Roderer from the community. She's the community care director at the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, as well as Tometa Kozart, a multicultural and equity officer for the Epilepsy Foundation at the national level. 
Um, Kathy, we'd like to talk to you next. Uh, my hope is that we may have people who know people who have epilepsy that are listening tonight. Uh, we may have some people who have epilepsy listening. And there may be people who haven't experienced it yet, but might have it um, at some point. And so my hope is to to have this down to earth conversation about this and just let people know this is this is what we've experienced as a family. Um, can you talk a little bit about being a parent of somebody who's diagnosed with, well, not of somebody, but of a daughter diagnosed with epilepsy, kind of what you went through and um, any advice that you might have? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Elise. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks, Liz, for setting the stage and starting this off and sharing uh, your first person experience. And so I'm just a proud mom. It's okay. Um, so I would I would say to the uh, to those people watching is that you may wonder why I want you to spread epilepsy awareness when your child doesn't have epilepsy, because at one point, neither did mine. And I was like other people, I thought epilepsy growing up, thought epilepsy was rare. I thought it was only where I didn't understand. I didn't know there were a lot of different seizures, types of seizure. I thought we just falling on the ground and shaking. I, I grew up with misconceptions and epilepsy stigma. So I only knew a limited amount, even though I'm a science teacher, like I still didn't know all about this, this, um, this uh, disability. So, you know, I grew up in an area where you were supposed to hold someone down. Um, if they're having a seizure or hold their tongue. So, you know, they couldn't swallow their tongue. By the way, don't do that. Don't hold people down. <laughs> take, the, take the class that Lizzie was talking about. But don't hold people down. You can't swallow your tongue. It's attached. Okay, so don't do that. So you don't need to worry about that. So, but there is like, people can bite their tongue. You know, Lizzie's gotten, you know, just where she's cut her tongue and stuff. So, um, but I also have to stop and think about as, as a parent and thinking about all those parents who had children before um, they're born before the 21st century. Um, and if you look historically, how people with epilepsy have been treated, that they're possessed by demons, um, she could have been prohibited from being married, um, just even in the 20th century, uh, forced, received forced sterilization. You know, hundred years ago, she would have done institutionalized, burned at the stake, fired from her job. And so it's a, it's a pretty tragic, uh, background. And so um, even though it's it's certainly not easy, you know, it is heartbreaking to know that historically what has happened. And so we're really trying to make a difference. And I appreciate you this raising awareness. Um, and because when we raise awareness, also we can uh, raise funds. And, and Renee will probably address that too, um, is that it's significantly underfunded. When you were talking about all of those um, you know, we, we hear like, you know, all of, you know, you know Parkinson's research and stuff. And that's great because uh, Liz has grandparents that had Parkinson's and found out, you know, she's unrelated. It's just a different neurological uh, situation that she has. And that's great. But, you know, all ages have epilepsy. And so we really, you know, that's, I think that's part of at the heart of why Lizzie and I um, and the other women are here just wanting to, to raise awareness for that. So what happened with Lizzie is that um, she started out with these myoclonic jerks. I didn't know. She's 14. You know, I don't know. She's an adolescent. Adolescents do weird things, right? You know, I don't know. And so looking back, I'm like, oh, I feel like the terrible parent. But you don't know what you don't know, right? You know, and so they started getting more pronounced. And I'm like, you know, maybe we should see a doctor. But epilepsy was not on her radar. When she had her first grand mal, I did not witness it. Her friend witnessed it. I thought she had a concussion. I thought she fell and had a concussion because she was confused and had a headache and was nauseous. And I, and so then we ended up in the emergency room and they, um, like they said, they, you know, recommended us to Helen DeVos Children's Hospital uh, neurologist, which we were so fortunate to be in Grand Rapids and being able to have that resource. Um, but um, like she said, you know, I was kind of thinking by the time she had the EEG and everything, the diagnosis was going that way, but it was, she just had Lizzie, when, when the doctor said epilepsy, that um, Lizzie had a very blank face. I mean, how would, how would she know, you know, what this is? Um, and as you can guess, it's horrifying to see your child have a seizure. I mean, there's a lot of dogs, including ours, that has uh, they have seizures. And I've had friends say, my dog has seizures and it's terrible. I can't imagine having, uh, watching your child have this. And, and it is, it's scary. Uh, they're in pain, they're scared. 
Um, they have these uncontrolled movements. And even when they come out of it, they're, they're disoriented, they're confused, terrible headaches, um, and they can just be out of it for the rest of the day even. And so as a parent, when, so Lizzie is just in a really good spot right now. And it was, it was a lot of rough years, not finding, not knowing that why she has it. And like I said, two thirds, we, we just don't know. And you just got to move on from that. It's like, let's treat it. Some medicines that didn't work, um, medicines that made her so exhausted and out of it. She missed so much school um, because of that is, and it's uh, when you have a seizure, it erases your memory. Like how can you take a test on something where like she doesn't, she would have no recollection. She read a book and she needed to have a literature test on it. She have no recollection. Are we saying, remember when here before she's like, I've never been here and we show her a picture and she's like, and it wouldn't even drag her memory. I mean, it's just, it's really tragic how it just can just um, erase uh, that memory. Um, so we just kept having trouble. Um, it was recommended that she would have an, an uh, implant and I was concerned about that. So we even went to, a, 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 to get a second opinion at another organization, we decided to then to not go forward that implant. So that's a, not some advice too I would give, like just, you know, find 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 information and, and get from various resources. Um, and so um, in fact, with Lizzie, to her credit, um, unfortunately, she missed so much school of high school because we had to figure this out in high school. You know, it wasn't like we figured it out when she was eight years old. We had to start figuring out this. She had just finished driver's training when she had her first uh, grand mall. And so um, uh, we had to, she missed a lot of school and it turns out by her senior year, she didn't have enough credits to graduate. And so we had to make a decision about, you know, what are we gonna do? She just gonna take online classes, at, you know, for a year after she graduate while classmates go on. But we found out that, um, and so I'm in education, some people don't know this, is that you don't have a high school, you don't have to have a high school diploma to enter community college, which is a great system because let's say you drop out at, you know, whatever age, you can enter, uh, go to community college. So she went to Grand Rapids Community College for two years, got her associate's degree, transferred to uh, Northern Michigan University last fall has had a fabulous time and has done so well. And she is on scale, on course. She's already got one college degree. She's going to get her second college degree um, next spring um, from NMU. And so she's very tenacious. And uh, so we appreciate with that. But she was handed a pretty raw deal. And uh, we, uh, you know, as a family, we have worked through this. I found out like, what I had to find out, like, what as much as good, I, I'd learn as much as I could. So I would just say, you know, learn, find some, some, uh, you know, find out stuff. Epilepsy 101. This is what I got. And I needed to get up to speed. So as a, I would encourage parents just to find out, get as much information as you can talk with your doctor, the first doctor that we were assigned to, that wasn't great. And so we found our second doctor at Helen DeVos Children's Hospital, who was fabulous. And now she's too old. And so she's graduated into the adult world of, of epileptologist. And so um, find, you know, go find out other resources. And I would say too, like Lizzie said, find your tribe, like you need the emotional support that I have from other parents, like you get it because you don't get it, you know, unless your kid goes through this. So what Lizzie has found with her peers and I would say with parents, um, finding that and just being a support and an encouragement and within and on the Facebook group, there's Facebook group for the Epilepsy Foundation and parents ask questions and throw that out. We do the strolls where we're together and it's just this big extended family. Um, but also, so I would say encourage people to learn what you can. Um, and also trust your mom gut, you know, like, you know, being able to communicate that and, um, but also uh, advocate for your child at school. So fortunately, because the American Disabilities Act, um, that there are protections and there's still some people who lose their jobs and stuff, but there's more protections in, in place than what historically there have been. But advocate for your child at school. You should have a 504 plan. Um, and that's what Lizzie had in school to help her with, uh, help her through. And so um, advocate for that, that by law in a public school, they need to have accommodations um, for um 
for the make accommodations for learning. And so the, we, uh, in the third school, we were very fortunate. They were very encouraging to support and we kept revisiting that and what can we do different and how can that work? Um, so advocate, you know, in the medical community, <laughs> Be a squeaky wheel, <laughs> advocate, and then um, also advocate in school and in your um, uh, in school, and then in, in the community um, and um, in the medical community along with the school. So, um, and the, you, you know, just talk with other parents; you can get a lot of um, support with that too. And like I said, connect with people, connect with people who who get it, who want to um, support you, and you can support them, and then just uh, just want to raise awareness uh, because with awareness, raising awareness comes funding and we that's what's going to make the difference. And I think if, you know, Lizzie, I think has always felt, she feels comfortable being on a Zoom call and recorded like this. So good job, Liz. Uh, but to be a voice for those that don't have a voice, she spoke in front of her high school um, and to let them know, even though that she knew there'd be some reper repercussions for that, that people need to know and people need to have compassion for for all disabilities, um, uh, but also like I would say, just finding your tribe, we kind of stumbled upon uh, a tribe. We have, we found out in Grand Rapids, we have this blue bridge and I found out that you can light it different colors. So Liz and I are wearing purple. So purple is the awareness color for epilepsy. And so we, it, November is Epilepsy Awareness Month. And so we, um, we had it lit purple and we really did it and told the news like, look, and what ended up happening, it was great that people saw that, but what happened is people in the community in West Michigan came together and met and that was the power. And I think still that we have those relationships and building on West Michigan and Renee knows that the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, which is on the east side of the state, just has embraced that and kept that going because finding that connection and people that know like that and it, relationships and connection and support um, is just so powerful. That's great. Kathy, Liz, you guys are a great team. <laughs> that's a, that's, we, we've lived this for seven yeah. years so right yeah. and like I said we this is something that's on our heart Lizzie organized a epilepsy awareness oh her cheerleading team organized epilepsy awareness mm -hmm. um football game and raised some funds there and brought awareness to it and realizing I think that Liz has always said that she's got this responsibility mm -hmm. uh she's been handed this well let's let's see what we can do let's put a positive spin on it and speak for, for those who don't have a voice yeah yeah that's terrific. That is a great segue into Renee. Uh, Renee Roderer is the community care director for the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. And I was, uh, I only met Renee, what, two weeks ago, maybe, but we've had some great conversations. So thank you for joining us tonight, Renee. Um, please share with us uh, information about the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. Yeah, I want to begin by just saying I'm so honored to be here and I love the work that the Center for Rural Health is doing and every single person on the screen is someone I know personally and have so much respect for. So it's it's an exciting night to be gathered together. Uh, the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan is an independent affiliate of the National Epilepsy Foundation as well. And we are here to serve the entire state of Michigan. And so this is really exciting for us to connect with the UP through this broadcast um, because we want to learn what it is that you need. And we also want to be able to connect with you about our programs and services and possibilities that are ahead. So at the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, we are trying to move the needle so that people with epilepsy can live their best life and make the choices that they desire. And we want people to be empowered and to feel connected, to feel supported. And then the other work we're doing is, is really front facing toward the community and doing that public awareness work so that we create a community that is easier and more affirming to live in. And, and so all of our programs and services seek to connect people to one another, to raise voices and, and amplify voices of people with epilepsy and also their families so that we can really do something collectively. Uh, and so I'd love to tell you just some of the things that we do. And also, as you are listening to this, people in the UP, please know that you can connect to us. And we have some exciting things coming up 
for the UP specifically. So first, let me tell you a bit about our programs and services, and then I'll come up, you know, talk about some upcoming events. Um, so a number of things that we do can all be found, by the way, on our website, which is epilepsymichigan.org. And uh, one thing I want to mention right from the outset is that we have a really wonderful resource called the Here For You Helpline. We'll put that number in the chat in a moment, but it's 800-377-6226. And people can call us from wherever they live, wherever they are, just to pick up that phone, dial the number. If you have questions about epilepsy, might be educational questions, uh, questions about resources. Where, where do I go for this? Where do I go for that? How do I get involved? And, and sometimes we have people call us simply to say, today is really hard. I just need to talk to someone about that. We are here for all of that. And as Liz said, as Kathy said, there are sometimes those moments, we, we don't want this to happen, but when someone is facing some sort of discrimination or needs some advice or some advocacy, we wanna hear that. And we journey with that story and those people and accompany that process and try to move things toward advocacy. So people can call us for any of those reasons. And that is our Here For You helpline. Um, for our community members, we have five support groups. These are called call and connect groups. And because we serve the entire state, we have, even before COVID was ever on the scene, we were doing things virtually because we do know we serve a large geographical area. Also, many people with epilepsy don't drive. So we have some great occasions for people to gather together. We have a group for adults that, um, now this started before the Zoom era, uh, but, our, but our, we've discovered that people really like this. We have a conference call <laughs> with adults for uh, with epilepsy that meets on Thursdays from 1 to 2.30 p.m. And I will tell you, I mean, if someone would have told me like, hey, hypothetically, we're going to start this group, it's going to be a conference call, and it's going to turn into this really robust community of connections, people that really take care of each other in their daily real lives. I don't know that I would have believed that, except that's exactly that what has happened. And anytime I tell, even call this uh, community a group, they say, no, 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 we're a family. They have decided they are a chosen family. And so if you need something like that, you need some people to go to that, there's just a number that you dial. And I realize that's important for people also who um, may not enjoy or, or have the possibility of having the technology of Zoom. We know in the UP in particular, there are some places that don't have good broad, broadband internet service. So that's an option. All our other groups are over Zoom, although you could dial into those two if that is what your preference would be. We have a group for parents that meets weekly and they support each other in such powerful ways. Uh, we have a group for young adults ages 18 to 25. That's where I first met Liz Preston. <laughs> and that group is such a joy. Um, it meets on the second and fourth Sundays of the month. We have a group for older adults over age 55 and also um, there are family caregivers, sometimes spouses in particular, and that meets on Wednesdays. And we have a group for teens that meets once a month. And um, that group for teens, I want to mention as well, because the, the call and connect for that group really was a um, came from a self-management program we do called eSmart. That's underway right now for teens um, ages 13 through 17. It's a six week program to learn about epilepsy, learn how to be a good self advocate. How do you develop resilience? How do you develop a social circle? And so we're in the midst of that program right now. And, and because of that, we've been able to meet a lot of teens with epilepsy. And then we said, hey, let's, let's add one of these support groups specifically for them. So if you are looking for support, what I want everyone here to hear, <laughs> you are not alone on this journey. I mean, you have heard some of these prevalent statistics tonight. Um, Elise was right that one in 100 have epilepsy actively, um, but this is another statistic we use often that one in 26 people will be diagnosed with epilepsy at some point in their life. That is so very common. So just know you're not alone. Um, we also have other self-management programs. And when I use that language, what I mean is that these are programs that meet for several weeks and help people um, 
consider how to, to best care for this condition. Uh, we also have a program called Project Uplift, which is um, one for people with epilepsy and also depression, anxiety, or high stress. And so through this, we teach mindfulness and meditation techniques um, and invite people to take, you know, that, that um, meaningful control of their health and to also feel that larger sense of well-being. Uh, and so that's something important that we do. Every year we choose a challenge of the year. This is some language that we will use to frame our work. And I'm pleased to say that our 2023 challenge of the year is called Breaking Barriers. You have heard people tonight talk about some of the barriers that people with epilepsy face. Well, something I've discovered is that when you begin to organize a community around one thing, like epilepsy, guess what? They're organized for other things. <laughs> so you get people to know each other and care about this. Then you can say, wait a minute, what do we need to do about transportation? What do we need to do about um, people who are living in food deserts and don't necessarily have access to what they need? Um, okay, well, what do we do about making sure people have access to appropriate epilepsy care and other kinds of medical care? So we organize our community and then we, we try to break all of those barriers. Uh, we have mentioned tonight seizure first aid training. This is a big thing that we do, that we want to do to um, change what the community is like so that when people do suddenly see someone have a seizure, they say, wait a minute, I know how to recognize this. I know how to care for this. So um, we can provide those in person or virtually, or you have this on-demand training that Liz mentioned tonight. But I do want to uplift um, something which I did put in the chat earlier, uh, which is that we have a seizure first aid training coming up on July 24th, and we want to invite residents of the UP into that one specifically. It's virtual. You don't have to go anywhere to sign on, and our staff will teach you about seizure recognition and first aid. Um, throughout the year, we have a number of events, too, that, that raise funds as well, and uh, earlier, Kathy was talking about our strolls for epilepsy. It's stroll season right now. And we have five of those across the state where people can come gather. It is our biggest fundraiser of the year, which allows us to do what we do at no cost or low cost. Uh, and it's also a big pep rally. That's what it feels like. Or maybe, you know, kind of a, a family reunion. <laughs> so you can see some of those opportunities on our website as well. And again, that's epilepsymichigan.org. Um, I also want to make sure that, you know, we have several conferences every year. We hold three annually, and those can be seen on our website. In fact, Tometa Cozart was our um, keynote speaker for our Epilepsy Innovation Conference, which happened um, last month. And we have a virtual one coming up. Again, you don't have to travel anywhere. It is our back-to-school conference on Saturday, August 12th, and we will discuss all sorts of issues to help kids with epilepsy get ready for school. And we're excited about that. So now I wanna do a great pivot and tell you about things that are happening in the UP soon and also in Northern Michigan. Uh, so we have some meetups coming up uh, this next month in July. So if you are from either of these areas or you're willing to travel to these areas, we want you to know that we are gonna be meeting in Munising on Sunday, July 9th, coming up soon from 6 to 7.30 p.m. We'll be at the Bensfield Bayshore Park and Marina. Uh, and then the very next day, we're gonna go to St. Ignace, uh, where we'll be on Monday, July 10th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at Bridgeview Park, which is an amazing view, by the way, <laughs> if you've been that way. Um, and uh, we're very excited about this. We wanna meet you. If you're hearing this and you're thinking, I've never had a community around my epilepsy experience or my family's experience. We don't want you to be alone. Come and meet us. We'll have refreshments there. And then I want you to know that also later in the fall, we are hoping to come and do a seizure first aid training in Marquette. So the date has not yet been chosen, but we're in conversation um, with the Center for Rural Health around that. And that they're our primary partner for that and we're looking forward to it. So that's kind of an overview. Uh, we're a community, we're an organization that, we are, that are, we're here for you and we want to know you. And uh, thanks for having us tonight. That's great. Thank you, Renee. You know, um, 
Let me just uh, add that I would like to include links on my webpage to both the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan as well as the the National Epilepsy Foundation I as well. Um, so I know that we have been doing that push on social media for these upcoming events that you have in the UP, and we will continue to do whatever we can to help get the word out there. I have shared that uh, with hospital administrators oh, in those you. geographic <laughs> regions. And, you know, we'll, we'll do what we can to try to get people to rally for you. So. That's exciting. We're very grateful. And then one other thing I should mention, it's not in the UP, but I know some people from the UP do travel down for this. The National Cherry Festival is happening soon in Traverse City, so in the upper lower. Um, and we are going to be present with something pretty exciting. It's called the Big Brain, and it is exactly what it sounds like, a huge inflatable brain. So if you are coming to that festival and, and 500,000 people come to that festival um, from all over the world, really, uh, come look for us. We'd love to meet you there and you can walk through our brain and learn how seizures happen. So thanks so much. Well, maybe you'll consider coming to the UP State Fair sometime. Well, we, we would love it. <laughs> I mean, at least uh, close to a third of the people in the UP come to yeah, us. So we we should definitely to... follow up about that. We would be delighted. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you. Appreciate it, Renee. Uh, listeners who might just be joining us, this is the UP Community Health Town Hall show. And tonight's episode is about epilepsy and increasing epilepsy awareness. Um, we're pleased tonight to have some wonderful speakers. Uh, Liz Preston, student at Northern Michigan University. Uh, Liz's mom, Kathy Ag. Thanks for being here to talk to us. Uh, Renee Roderer uh, just spoke, Community Care Director for the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. And next, we're going to talk with the ever so patient, <laughs> Tometa Cozart. Uh, Tometa is the Multicultural Outreach and Health Equity Officer for the Epilepsy Foundation at the national level. Thank you, Tometa, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a joy and a pleasure to be a part of this discussion. Um, I am overwhelmed with the aspect of hearing um, how much of an advocate um, the family is. And so I'm so glad to hear that because for the Epilepsy Foundation, that's what we do every day. Um, we're a national voluntary health organization that were dedicated to the 3.4 million individuals that are living with epilepsy um, and their families and their caregivers. So to be able to have those individuals empowered to be self-advocates is exactly you know, what we want to see. So um, all of the things that have been mentioned, of course, are the things that you know, we support every single day in terms of training. And our national certification around seizure first aid has been mentioned several times tonight, um, but I just want to make sure that we reiterate the fact that that is a two-year certification. We are the only organization that actually offers that level of certification, similar to CPR, um, and we do have an ex uh, abbreviated version that has been mentioned, the 30-minute, um, but of course, to take that 90-minute um, or either in-person um, or live instruction and to pass that pre and post test, you get that two year certification. Um, and why that's important is because of the fact of, as we said before, it's not just the families of those individuals living with epilepsy who we need to make sure are trained or aware, um, but we need all of our communities to be um, aware. And so as we talked about the aspect of um, people being able to support individuals, um, you know, I too have a similar story that I didn't always work in epilepsy. I do not have epilepsy myself. Um, and I was working in a university setting and had a student who um, had a, a focal um, awareness, um, aware um, seizure in my class, um, meaning the fact that she literally was just looked like she was dazed off. And so I thought uh, my lecture was boring. <laughs> and so um, I just went on to the next student and, um, you know, and then she started talking again, like nothing happened. So that's how I knew that um, something was not right um, for the fact that, you know, she was not aware of this aspect of the gap in her speaking um, and speaking to her after class, I realized that um, although I had worked in public health for 10 years, had transitioned into teaching about health education, um, I still had no idea in terms of the aspect of really how to help and support that young lady um, because she was 19. Um, she called it losing time and she had been losing time um, for about 10 years. So since she was nine um, and neither her or her parents had taken her to see a specialist or neurologist, they really didn't think it impacted um, her life. However, of course, 
she's 19 years old at this huge university um, and she doesn't know how to drive. So she had been making decisions along the way in terms of the aspect of um, modifying her lifestyle based on um, this, is, this issue. Um, but it did take her having an actual tonic clonic seizure, you know, of course, where she actually did shake and convulse um, and fall out in public for her family to get her to a neurologist and sure enough, she was diagnosed with epilepsy. But that was my opening to the fact of I knew very little about um, seizures, um, about epilepsy, um, and again, working in public health for a while and focused on minority health and health equity, I did not really know how to support um, her and wanted to be a part of um, the change of how I can address that. So now that I'm with the foundation, I really focus on um, making sure that we are focusing on having a seizure safe nation. And so that's why we do want absolutely everyone, regardless of your profession um, or your health status to learn seizure first aid. Um, in addition to that, we have a variety of programs um, that we, again, work with our affiliates, uh, like EF Michigan. Uh, we have at least 48 affiliates around the state, uh, excuse me, around the country. Um, and in those areas where we don't have an affiliate, we have regional um, individuals that help us to be able to serve still in those states. So there's still someone that can help you regardless of where you live. So, um, but we're thankful to have EF Michigan uh, to be able to cover the state of Michigan. And we work very closely with them to implement a lot of our national programs at the local level. So many Renee have already uh, mentioned, but just a few I would like to mention since again, we kind of brought up those things is um, our legal defense fund. So the aspect of um, being discriminated against because of epilepsy, unfortunately, as we've heard earlier, uh, does happen, it still does occur. Um, we also know that there's a lack of understanding and awareness amongst individuals who work in law enforcement. And so we do have a course where we can help them to be a little bit more understanding about epilepsy, about seizures, um, and then understanding the rights of individuals um, who are living with epilepsy in terms of the aspect of their encounters with our community. Um, if someone finds themselves in a legal issue um, and it has something to do directly with their diagnosis, we do have funds at the national level that really help to be able to support those types of cases. Um, that is something that we're trying to bring more awareness to um, because of the fact that we understand that the stigma does exist nationally. Um, we also have launched a national anti-stigma campaign. And so um, that campaign has been seen around the country. We will be broadening the aspect of those ads and that information um, more um, in the coming years. And so we hope for the fact that Michigan will um, be able to support some of that um, marketing of those messages so that you'll be able to see those digitally um, and in more traditional print as well. So again, as we bring awareness to epilepsy, but also try to change people's mindsets as we've talked about today in terms of how important that is. Um, whereas if people don't understand and they don't know, um, sometimes there is fear and sometimes there is judgment. Um, and so we want to be on the front end of being able to help and support that. One of the other settings that I definitely want to mention because it's been mentioned tonight um, is schools. And so um, we do have a lot of training um, around the aspect of focusing on personnel within schools. Um, the Seizure Safe Act is um, legally a policy that has been passed um, in um, almost 20 states. Um, and so we are um, trying to help all of those states to be able to address what that policy says. Um, but most of it has to do with training. And so school personnel must be trained in seizure first aid um, and epilepsy awareness, and then also how to help and support those families that have seizure action plans. Um, and so we do training uh, online and in person to be able to help and support that as well. Amanda, and I, did, I don't want to put you on the spot, but can I ask you, is Michigan one of those states? Um, Renee, I'm going to uh, yield to you. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I can speak to that. We have been championing this legislation and we, we want it to be passed this year. So the okay. answer is not yet, but we okay. are um, we are prepared to reintroduce it. It was introduced in the last legislative cycle. Uh, it never did come to a vote of the floor. And so if it doesn't go through um, in that first cycle, then you have to reintroduce but however, we have built such beautiful consensus around the Seizure Safe Schools Act, and we're very excited about what is to come with it. Uh, we have partners, um, the Michigan PTA is championing it right next to us. Um, we have a number of teachers and people with epilepsy and parents that are behind this, and we're very excited about what's coming later this year. So stay tuned, please, when it is introduced, 
We will have um, action alerts. Please contact your your representative, your your senators um, at the state level, and we're going to get this done. Yeah, that's important. You know, I, there are people who are willing to be advocates. They just don't know what to do. And so I think sometimes just working with people through that to let them know, you know, how they can further support. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, Tom. Is there is there anything else that that you wanted to share? Um, no, that that's perfect. And to be honest, that's exactly what we're here for, right? Because yeah. we want yeah. people to know exactly how they can support our efforts in their state, and that is needed. Like I said, we are up to almost twenty, and we want Michigan to to be one of those. Um, but last but not least, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that one of the other things that we're doing to uh, make sure we're striving towards equity when it comes to being able to address epilepsy disparities is that we actually give out funds every single year um, for our affiliates to be able to focus on some aspect of um, equity are looking at some inequities that are in their communities. And so, um, again, we're really pleased to know that Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan has one of those. And so they, um, a lot of the, the events that they just mentioned um, and the focus on, you know, your community in this rural part of Michigan um, is part of one of those social determinants of health grants. So again, those are the things that we do at the national level, um, but really supporting the work that's happening locally. That's terrific. And I think there's a lot more that can be done across the Upper Peninsula. Um, I mean, I know that there's a lot more that could be done, but I think starting with this, you know, increasing that awareness is is some, that's a good step, right? That's the first step is to try to do that. Um, I think that Liz has done a great job in doing what she can right now at Northern, and we have plans to continue to try to get the word out. So I appreciate that. And having all of you on as panelists, of course, <laughs> that's super fantastic. Um, we want to do what we can to try to promote your upcoming activities that are coming up, uh, Renee, so that people can engage with you. Excited to think that Marquette could potentially host one in October. So um, good central point, you know, as far as that is concerned. Um, we will add your links to our webpage for sure. Uh, I want to remind everybody that a recording of this show will be available on nmu.edu slash rural health. Uh, we store all of our episodes of the town hall programs. Uh, they are available. A new feature that we're going to be adding to the town hall uh, programs on the webpage is that we are hoping to be, uh, well, we already have, but we haven't laid it out there on the platform yet, but we're setting up um, kind of like a mini quiz. So we've had some faculty and teachers that have assigned episodes to students to watch to learn more about particular topics. And so we're going to put a few quizzes out there so that people can take a quiz after they watch an episode to see kind of what they retained and learned. So um, it's exciting to have that input from teachers and the education level um, to, to really expand, you know, access to understanding some of the efforts that are out there right now. So that's pretty exciting. So I, I really want to thank all of you for being on the program tonight. Uh, Liz, you're fantastic. Thank you for all you do um, and all you continue to do. And let's just consider this the first step of many with getting out epilepsy awareness. Kathy Agee, wonderful to have you on as a parent. And I really appreciate the perspective that you've provided to everybody. Uh, Renee Roderer from Community Care Director from Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. Nice to have you here. That's It's been great to get to meet you over the last couple of weeks and be able to share everything. And Tometa, your patience. I know you're the last panelist. So thanks for everything, um, for joining us tonight, uh, having a national presence in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, we look forward to doing what we can to get the word out. And I hope that all of you will join us. You know, we'll stick in this together. Keep getting the word out. Thanks so much.